Thanks for listening to the Get Over Yourself podcast, brought to you by Carol Fit Stationary Bike Program 8-Minute Workouts to Get Super Fit, Perfect Keto, the cleanest, highest potency ketone supplements, MOFO, Male Optimization Formula with Organs to Boost Testosterone, Let's Get Checked, At Home Testing Kits, try LGC.com. Almost Heaven, beautiful compact home use sauna kits. Brad's Macadamia Masterpiece, the mind-blowing nut butter blend. And check out bradkearns.com slash shop, my personal selection of favorite products for health, fitness, and peak performance. And here we go with the show. Only a reason that we even have consciousness, the ability to make decisions about the world is because that sensory input coming from the outside is delivering us a choice. And it doesn't even matter what sensation this is. This could be the most pleasurable sensation you've ever had. This could be the most horrible sensation you've ever had. It's coming into our body to, so our minds can make a choice about what that sensation means and what we can do with it. Think about the apocryphal story of like a pregnant woman. And there's always a story though of like a woman being like, husband, you must go out and get me pickles and peanut butter right now, right? There's like these weird cravings. Well, what are those cravings really? Maybe it's like your ancient taste system coming in and being like, I need a certain type of nutrient. What I do write about are the sensations and emotions of food. When you go to a grocery store and you walk down the aisles uh, and you look at a bag of, say, Cheetos, uh, I'm pretty sure that it says something on the bag to the equivalent of, it is a party in your mouth. Our taste system was not built to detect parties in your mouth. It was built to detect nutrients in the environment that you needed. Hey listeners, I'm pleased to welcome Scott Carney returning to the show for a second appearance to talk about his new book, The Wedge. Evolution, Consciousness, Stress, and the Key to Human Resilience. If you didn't hear our first show about his book, What Doesn't Kill Us, go back and listen to that. This is the investigative journalist and anthropologist who was assigned many years ago to investigate the Iceman Wim Hof. Scott's an expert in debunking myths and gurus, but instead he got immersed into the amazing world of breath control and cold exposure and performed the amazing, magnificent athletic feats as a total novice. He climbed with Wim Hof to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro in a record time of 30 hours. He's pictured there shirtless in minus 30 Fahrenheit weather, overcoming all these perceived limits by using the breath control techniques. So he wrote that great book, What Doesn't Kill Us, but then discovered uh, in a neuroscientific level, what was going on and how we have the power, the ability to discover this wedge in between stimulus and response. So this is a pretty heavy duty book and we get into some scientific observations during the show, but he's such a fun loving guy and he's a great storyteller. So I think you're going to follow along really nicely. The book starts out with his quote, life is all about stress and choices. And the wedge is a choice that separates stimulus from response. We do not have to react in these pattern ways that we've learned to throughout our lives. I think you're going to love it and learn so much and have this practical application of this crazy stuff where you'd never think to jump into a chest freezer filled with cold water or an icy mountain lake and, you know, uh, pass it off as something that's ridiculous and not your kind of thing. But Scott does a great job drawing the parallels and the associations with uh, uh, pursuing our physical limits, our endurance limits, and getting through day-to-day -day life with more happiness and joy and more emotional and sensory control. So it's very, very important to push these limits now and then to rediscover what it's like to be human because today with the luxuries and conveniences, oh my gosh, we're just wilting into pathetic creatures that have lost all these evolutionary advantages. Let me read some promo content and set up the show nicely and then we get into it quickly. Uh, in fact, 
investigative journalist and anthropologist Scott Carney discovers how humans can wedge control over automatic physiological responses into the breaking point between stress and biology, and doing so, we reclaim our evolutionary destiny. And what's cool about Scott, he's an ordinary guy. He's a journalist living in Colorado. He's not some super athlete or biohacker or guru, and he puts in an appropriate plug for being able to enjoy a normal life and chill and watch Netflix at home and especially makes the point of not looking to gurus, but the importance of finding your own way. But he also is standing as this participatory journalist, uh, honoring the importance of pairing these luxuries and comforts that we're surrounded by with pushing the limits and exploring your outer boundaries and your potential. I think you're going to love the show. Go grab a copy of the book, The Wedge, get his other book, What Doesn't Kill Us, and you are off and running. Here we go with Scott Carney. Scott Carney, international, globe-trotting, best-selling author. I'm so glad to catch up with you again. We talked about your book, What Doesn't Kill Us. I want the listeners to go back and listen to that. But now, an incredible sequel called The Wedge. So I look forward to to wedging into this topic with you, man. You've had quite an adventure. I'm calling you the George Plimpton of 2020. <laughs> international man of mystery, Scott Carney, comes on the podcast. <laughs> well, I mean, if you, if you want to be a writer, uh, you young listeners out there that aspire to that profession, um, the, the best part about your... Your, your message is just that you're up for anything and you're up for that adventure yeah. and then going to share it with all of us. And I think that's what, a, that's what the beauty of books are is we're going into your world. Um, we didn't have to travel to Latvia to go get stuck in a, uh, right. a, a hot box until we're about to pass out. But you know, the value of some of these insights I think is so tremendous today because things are getting so much you know, luxurious, comfortable, uh, we, we've lost our connection to, you know, what makes us human. And now you're bringing it all back in the wedge, man. Yeah. And now we're all stuck in quarantine. So you can't even get outside anymore without a mask and a, and a, and a full body bubble or else you're going to die of COVID. It's very scary. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, soon, soon into this book, you, you make this quote that life is all about stress and choices. And the wedge is defined as a choice that separates stimulus from response. And so therefore it applies to just about everything we're doing and mm -hmm. the cold exposure and jumping in the icy lake and doing Wim Hof and climbing the mountain. I think a lot of people have like a, a healthy arm's length from all that. But I think what right. you did in this book is you took it to a whole bunch of different topics. So I'd love to love to get into some of that. Yeah, well, here's the heart of everything. So uh, all of you podcast listeners can, can tune in to this one idea is that we evolved with a sensory system, right? We feel things, we think about things, and, and, and stuff comes in to our body from the outside world. And that, that, that manifests as a feeling or a sensation, right? Well, here's the Here's the big picture. Well, why do we have sensations in the first place? Like the only reason that we even have consciousness and the ability to make decisions about the world is because that sensory input coming from the outside is delivering us a choice. And it doesn't even matter what sensation this is. This could be the most pleasurable sensation you've ever had. This could be the most horrible sensation you've ever had. It's coming into our body to, so our minds can make a choice about what that sensation means and what we can do with it. And, uh, and to that degree, sensation is actually sort of neutral in a way. It's just telling us, it's saying this is a strong signal coming from the outside world. And then, you know, you talked about ice baths and I, I've done many, many an ice bath in my life. And that's a, that's a screaming signal coming from the outside world, right? And it comes in and you're covered in cold water and you're saying, this is the worst thing I've ever experienced in my whole life. Cause that's what usually we, we do. And then, and then your body has this automatic response, right? Where you clench, everything clenches in your whole body. And, and yet there is a choice in that clenching between the stimulus of the ice water and the response your body makes where you can decide, hey, I don't want to clench. I'm smarter than clenching. I can actually relax. And when you do that, your, your, your whole relationship with that stimulus changes and you find out 
Um, especially with a non like lethal stimulus, like ice water, you know, you could do this in fire, but that's probably a bad idea. Um, <laughs> you, you, you can realize that when you relax, your body decides it's going to heat itself in another way. And then you've accessed a whole nother part of your biology. So what the wedge is, what this whole book, what this whole like experience I've been doing for like the last 11, 12 years is saying, look, our sensations mean things and it's not always what we assume at the first instance. There's We're going to die. Action. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to die not or, or alternately, this is the best experience I've ever had, right? It could be, I'm sitting on the couch, I'm listening, net, I'm watching Netflix and I never want to leave. And that's also a stimulus. And, and, you know, and both of those are not always right at all times. So, so, you know, when we pay attention to our sensations, when we pay attention to that sort of like limbic system, that lizard brain that's giving you sort of first impressions of the world, the reason we're conscious is to make second impressions. I guess that distinguishes us from the the animal kingdom, uh, the less evolved creatures. Some of them, but although I think that this comes up from right from evolution. I mean, if you look at other um, mammals, especially, right, they have some level of consciousness. You know, I have a cat who's very manipulative. Like, it knows how to like how to like push all of my buttons, and it is definitely learning about me. Now, I think I'm smarter than my cat, but to think that that these don't come up from lesser places um, would be a mistake. We are a product of evolution and all of our senses evolve from lower forms and everything on this planet has evolved the same amount of time. Uh, you know, it's not like humans have evolved more. Like a cat is just as evolved as a human. It's just evolved in a different direction. But the abilities that we have, you know, the ability to sense the world, for instance, um, comes up from down below. And if you look at the brain structures of especially mammals, um, you'll see that they have got a lot of the same stuff going on. So we have to assume that they can do some of the same things. And if you look at some animals, even up like some semblance of language, like, you know, if you look at dolphins and you, you, you dissect, this is something my wife is working on right now. This is not actually in my book, but we're just going on a tangent already. Um, so, so there's something called Zips law, Z-I-P-H law. Um, where they look at they, they, look, they looked at English and they said, "Look, how many times does the letter E show up in like, in like James Joyce? How many times does the letter A show up in James Joyce?" And they found that there's sort of a logarithmic curve with how, with how letters show up, and there's, there's like a coefficient you can give to mm-hmm. complex language. Whereas like baby speech has no coefficient associated with it. If you if you program that into like whale speech, dolphin speech, and, and several other a- animal speech. You or sounds, you find that they coordinate to a coefficient that has some semblance to language. We have no idea what it's saying. You know, it's probably talking about politics, just like we are. But um, <laughs> but it says something, and that's really really interesting. Right on. And back to the, um, the 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 space between the stimulus and response. And we had that extreme example of doing your magnificent feats as a novice. Uh, but if you think about just the routine. Uh, having an argument and mm-hmm. getting reactive and d- digging these dysfunctional patterns of relationships and things that we do in day to day life. And, totally. you know, the term wedge has so many different meanings, but it could be that you, you, do, you know, you build some skills doing crazy stuff like jumping in the cold tub. And theoretically, or I'm hoping because I'm a big cold plunge enthusiast, is this going to help me be uh, less reactive and, you know, getting out of this pattern behavior when mm-hmm. I have an exchange uh, in the parking lot because I park too close or, you know, getting into uh, flawed dynamics mm-hmm. with people close to you in the workplace or in family friend right. circle. Well, it can, especially if you're conscious about it. And I think that that consciousness is very important. Like you could do all of the cool biohacking stuff <laughs> you want in your life. But if if you're just biohacking or ice bathing or whatever you want to call it, um, just for the sake of that, um, to become a better ice bather, then it's not going to actually affect um, your relationships. But if you do these things and, and add an emotional component to them, and we can talk about how you can do that. But if you're, if you're doing, you know, I, 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 we have ice baths and we had, I do this other thing in the book where I throw kettlebells, like these big heavy weights, and you, you try to catch them with another person. And what this is pr- trying to do is stoke fear. Like you're going to hit my foot or I'm going to hit your foot. And, and that creates a, a, a situation which um, is a strong stimulus, right? It's hitting your emotions. I might hurt myself or I might hurt my wife, 
for instance. Um, uh, and that's, a, that's an emotional response, but it's also a physical response, like how you're moving your body. And when you start doing these things and trying to, to, to twinge emotional responses and sensory responses, then when you get into another situation, such as now, let's say I'm getting an argument with my wife later, and that's not just in the intellectual realm, right? That's not just happening in your, in the gray matter in the top of your head. That's also happening in sensations in your body. Cause you know, you get angry, your blood pressure changes, your, your te- body temperature changes, metabolism, all these things change in your body. And we think it's just an emotion, but the truth is that emotions and sensations are bonded at a very fundamental level in our neurology. So, so that, um, emotional argument you are in is also a sensory argument that has all of these other associations that you have in your body that you may not, you're usually not even conscious of. So that now when we do things like ice baths, when we do things like heat training, when we do things like, you know, all of these other crazy things that I've done in the wedge, when you start doing that and you realize that sensation and emotion are linked, then you become more resilient because you become sensory resilient first, right? The ice baths, first a sensation, but then there's the emotion. Oh my God, I'm going to die. I have to get out of here. Uh, and then when you have that emotion, now you're, you're manipulating both your emotional resilience and your physical resilience. And, you know, it makes you a better person. It doesn't make you an angel, but it makes you, it gives you like another tool in your toolkit. Uh, I guess that's kind of a component of the flow state. You mentioned, uh, check sent me Halley in the book and Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, you went to throw those kettlebells because you needed to up the ante yourself from, mm-hmm. let's say, going in the cold tub. Scott Carney knows he's not going to die now because he's done it right. a million times. So it doesn't have that that fear component. So, right. um, yeah, tell me about that 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 game you played with the the kettlebell throwing expert as a, as a, again a total novice walking into something mm-hmm. that you know you you drop one of those things on your foot. Uh, you're going to have to write about that. It might not be as pleasant to the to the whole mm-hmm. experience, your, the, the desired outcome is to overcome your fear. Well, the, the interesting thing about um, how I learned about kettlebells is actually uh, the moments before I even heard about them. I was actually hanging out at this lab in Stanford, um, talking to, about fear with this this um, somewhat famous um, neuroscientist named um, Andrew Huberman. And what he does is, is you know, to, to really give him a short shrift, right? <laughs> what he does is he puts people in virtual reality simulations of diving with sharks. And usually the, this is to stoke the fear response so that then he can study fear in the body. And, uh, and I was like, cool, you're gonna, I, I can see how my biology of fear works in my body. And I, and I, and, and maybe this is a way to work the wedge, right? I can get really scared and then I can control my fear and then I'll be like fearless or something. <laughs> and, or something. Um, or something. I don't know what's going to happen. And so I get into his virtual shark tank. And while he's described the neurology of fear very well, um, virtual sharks are sort of lame. You know, they're not super scary. They're like, oh, look, a, a video of a shark. <laughs> and Coming so, right at so, you. <laughs> coming right at me. Look at that video of a shark. And so I was like, oh, okay, this doesn't work. And it does work if you have like a shark phobia. Like if you're, if you're, if you're, if, if you're, you know, so scared of sharks that you can't do anything, then it does work, but that's just not me. So I sort of got out of his lab being like, huh, all right, that's cool. Uh, you know, I, now I understand something about virtual sharks, but I really wanted the, the visceral internal experience. And as I'm walking out of the lab, I got a message from my friend, uh, Tony. And Tony says, uh, Scott, you have to meet my friend, Michael Castro Giovanni up in San Francisco. He's going to throw kettlebells at you and put you in a flow state. And I was like, that's the douchiest message I've ever gotten on my phone <laughs> ever. <laughs> you know, like, whoa. But I have this thing, as you meant, sort of mentioned at the top, I like to, when I'm reporting, um, basically say yes to everything. You know, just <laughs> go in there and just be like, you know, we'll see what the world offers me. And, uh, and so since we're sort of in that state, uh, I'm like, okay, well, let's go see what this kettlebell throwing stuff is about. And, so let me paint the picture for you, for you. We go to San Francisco. I think it's a place called Strawberry Hill. Uh, and uh, it, it's sort of a, a beautiful park, San Francisco outcropping, overlooking some sort of marina or something. And uh, and Michael is basically a gorilla, right? So my, he's huge. He's, his, 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 his biceps are like the size of my thighs. Uh, uh, he's been working out 
intensely his whole life. And me, I'm pretty much an average guy. Like I don't have a six pack. I know that some, some listeners would be like, wait, what? This guy doesn't have a six pack. He doesn't know anything, but it's true. No six pack over here. The, um, Michael has like a six pack on his bicep and, uh, and, and he's holding this cannonball essentially. Like it's a, it's a, I think it's like 25 pounds of iron. So not like crazy, right? But he is known to throw 300 pound kettlebells. Thankfully he wasn't doing that with me. And, and he's standing across from me. And anytime two men are facing each other and one of them's holding a weapon, there is a natural environment that you create, especially when, when you know that one guy's going to throw it at the other person, you know that there is a, a fear sensation that is just that's just part of this. I mean, men are competitive. Like, so there's all this like emotional crap that we have going on. And, and, and the ritual of his kettlebell throwing program is called kettlebell partner passing. If you want to go look it up. On the <laughs> um, nice name. Yeah. yeah. So, he, so it's three swings before you actually let go and it flips around and you do its thing. So the first swing, he's looking at you deeply in the eyes. So this shows you what you're trying to do is connect with each other, like where their mind is. You know, you can tell a lot when you look at someone's eyes and he swings the kettlebell, like a normal kettlebell swing, right? goes up to like your mid chest, a little higher. Um, and you're looking at each other's eyes and then he swings it again, goes between his legs, comes up. And now you switch your gaze from the person who's about to kill you, Michael, to the thing he's going to kill you with, which is the the metal. And I'm like, okay, here it comes. And, you know, again, I've never actually even touched a kettlebell before in my life. Again, no six pack over here. This is the first time I've ever done this. And I'm like, oh shit, he's going to throw it at me. And then he, he does it one a third time. And I'm just laser like focused on this kettlebell at this point. And he lets go and it flips through the air. And I am just so focused and my butt puckers so tightly that if I put a piece of coal in there, it would be a diamond. And uh, I grab the handles all of a sudden, just through the air, and I pass it back to him. And, and because we are so focused on the actual danger of breaking my foot or breaking his foot, both of us, are, our movements coordinate automatically. And what's super interesting about this, they're coordinating automatically because, not because we're looking at each other, but because we're looking at an intermediary between us. And all of a sudden, this thing that we're doing is no longer adversarial. It's no longer about murdering the other person, right? It becomes a dance where we're dancing and playing with something which is dangerous. And that is what an instantaneous flow state is all about. Like you have a, a sort of this sensation of risk this this real risk i mean it's not fake this isn't like a fake shark you can't fake the flow state so the risk is real has to be yeah the foot is always going to be there because you're standing and and, you know you do your best not to hurt your foot but it's there and then because it's actually it's not that hard to throw a kettlebell it's just like one half rotation as it goes around you can do some other moves and stuff like that but that thread is always there so if you um the only way that you start fucking up is when you start getting overconfident you're like oh there's no threat right Mm -hmm. Ah, there's no threat we're just doing this other stuff and so so it sort of but it sort of forces you to maintain that focus and that flow state and then this whole thing is about empathy it's all the whole thing becomes about trust and it's a workout between two people and like how often do you get like two guys learning you know and michael will say this to you right he'll like throw the kettlebell with love you know, putting that emotion into this. And, and what's like super fascinating is if you get couples doing this, you know, because every, uh, um, it becomes like a sort of like um, therapy session in a weird way. Because remember how I talked about sensation and emotion are sort of linked? Well, every relationship, I don't care how great it is, has little places you don't want to go, right? Little things that undermine trust. And, I, and, you know, it could be different for different people. It could be work, it could be family, it could be kids, it could be pets. I don't know. There's stuff that you don't want to talk about, right? And so usually when couples are throwing at first, they suck at it because you're looking at the, your partner and you're like, oh, great, Scott's over there. Yeah, he's going to throw this on my foot because I don't trust him because of these other, other things that are undermining. And then you start to learn how to trust physically and without words. And it's, and you know, Michael, who, who does this all the time, um, he's like, yeah, it's like you see the whole relationship play out in motion. Uh, and then, you know, then you start to learn to trust each other. And it's like it's a different way to communicate. So the challenge is of appropriate difficulty and consequences. 
Mm-hmm. And that's what gets you in the flow state. I like that caveat about the flow state that if it's too difficult, like, hey, we're going to take you up to the tallest uh, overpass in North America and we're going to do bungee jumping. If that's not your thing and you have no experience, you're just going to get scared. So you have to find right. that 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 place where uh, mm-hmm. Michael, the gorilla, assessed your physical capabilities and said, yeah, this guy can mm-hmm. catch a 20-pound kettlebell. Mm-hmm. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't out of your league, but it was just stretching you, I guess. And so right. I, I guess the point is to to seek out adventures of this nature uh, mm-hmm. to try to try to build that resilience, that emotional and the sensory resilience. Absolutely. And, you know, and everything I write about in The Wedge is not um, confined to the 10 techniques that I look at, right? I mean, the right. point of this, the point of this is to say, look, this exists in everything that we do from standing around at line in the DMV, right, to um, road rage, to watching Netflix on your, in your couch. Like there, there's sort of like sensories and choice things that happen all the time. And, um, and it's a different perspective. And, and, and the, but the important thing to remember are the sensations that go with it. You know, we like to numb ourselves. I mean, hell, I still like to numb myself. You probably still like to numb yourself. It's not like I'm an enlightened being t- coming from like the ether. I'm telling you how to live. We all have these you know, I open What Doesn't Kill Us, which is the previous book, with the line, hey, my spirit animal is a jellyfish. <laughs> and, and it's true. Like, we all have this pull towards comfort. But that, that, that is a choice that we're always making. And sometimes it's better to push out of that place, right? To push into it to new territory. And, uh, and, that, and, and you find wedges there because you know who we are as people like who you are when you think of yourself right and you think about the um you try to define who you are it's usually you don't define it through the events like i totally binged the wire on my couch last (laughs) weekend right that's not like the epitome of you you think about you as the person who overcame certain challenges right whatever those may be everyone's challenges are different but i think of myself like on the razor's edge of life and death right and 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 that is how i like to define myself versus scott didn't put on pants today like and and so and, and this is where we find the wedge on those places where you're stretching yourself where there are stakes and where we hope you overcome them right i mean you don't want to die. You choose your challenges wisely. Don't jump off the highest bridge with no bungee cord and hope you're going to make it. Like, be smart about it, but uh, but also s- stretch yourself. Right. And I guess then, at least in my case, when we're numbing ourselves with big bowls of popcorn and binge watching Netflix, having those life experiences to balance that out, I think it makes for a richer experience that you had a big day and, and overcame some challenges. And so I want you to talk a little bit about this Mount Kilimanjaro achievement that you did. And, you know, as, as an ordinary guy from Colorado, okay, the fittest, healthiest state, but still you weren't coming <laughs> into this thing with this, uh, Im- impressive pedigree of being a badass. Right. And, you know, this, this accomplishment, I imagine you're carrying that forward every day for the rest of your life in some profound way that, you know, now, now you define yourself by something like that. Right. I, I, well, I mean, I, Kilimanjaro is one of the things that I, that I look back on. I wouldn't say it's the thing that defines me, but it was a very powerful moment. And what it was, was this is the, the last chapter in What Doesn't Kill Us, where, where I climb up Kili with Wim Hof, who's this famous Iceman guy. You probably have heard of him. And, uh, and we're doing it, uh, I'm doing it shirtless, and we're doing it fast, right? Because climbing up Kilimanjaro on its own is actually not that crazy. Usually people take five to 10 days to get to the top. You do your slow acclimatization. It's not technical. We don't need ropes and ice axes or anything like that. However, when you do it really fast, you really up your chances of altitude sickness. And when I'd ask the, you know, how fast we were doing, it was 30 hours. It's supposed to take five days to get to the top. Um, and when I asked the army, you know, what's going to happen when we go up there, they're like, you're all going to die. You're just going to die doing this. And what we did is we is the Wim Hof breathing method. If you've ever heard of it, it's like um, hyperventilation and then breath retention, hyperventilation, breath retention, until you can hold your breath for a really, really long period of time. Um, and I can hold my breath like three minutes or something like that after doing this Wim, Wim stuff. Uh, but when we're climbing the mountain, because the oxygen levels are more dispersed, so it's like, it's like thinner and thinner air, uh, we just did the Wim Hof breathing without the retention, so just fast breathing. 
basically the whole way up the mountain. So like, uh-huh. and, and, and I made it up with whim in 28 hours. We actually beat our goal of what we were trying to do to this place called Gilman's point, uh, which is actually right below the true summit, but for all intents and purposes, it's the top of the mountain. And, uh, and I did it shirtless and, and, and the, the, the insight that comes out of this, and it's like negative 30 out there with, you know, the gusty wind and all that stuff. And the, the, the insight is that as I'm climbing up this mountain, I'm feeling this like um, just ridiculously cold wind on my body. And I, and I think to myself, look, I am not fighting this mountain, right? I'm not here it, like using grit to just force myself through this like in- impossible challenge. Instead, I am participating with the environment. And those sensations are part of me. And, and in that sense, I had to, it's the cheesiest thought that I've ever had in my life, which is I am not on the mountain. I am the mountain, right? And, um, and, and this is like this really sense of oneness because it was a sense of cooperation, a, a sense of, and then not with other people, although there were um, some people there with me. I, I made it to the, the top with Wim and one other guy. Um, it was this sense that those sensations are me and that I'm connected to the environment through my nervous system and my sensory system. And my brain gets to decide what, what I'm doing there. And it gave me an incredible resilience um, in, in weather that most people would think would be deadly and is deadly. I mean, could I, if I, I could have certainly died, but I didn't. <laughs> oh, man. And, and so then when you immerse back into real life, um, I'm curious if this kind of can serve as an anchor for you to be a uh, less bitchy boy Scott when it's time to uh, argue and bicker or when you don't get your order uh, properly at the restaurant or, you know, things that generally set us off, um, having gone to the extremes of, uh, you know, mm-hmm. human, human performance and, and endurance. Um, is there, is there a, a connection there to everyday life? I, there is, and, which is not to say that I'm perfect in all situations, right? I'm sure I have snapped in ways that are not um, like, even now, I'm not perfect, go figure. But I do think that what it does is it gives me a moment to take breaths, right? A moment to say, look, my body's going crazy. And one thing that I've noticed that is that like, like always works for me. It's like, I'm 40 two as of in a week from now, I'll be 42. And, and the, and the horrible thing about being this great advanced age um, is that if I drink one beer, I get a hangover the next day. This just happens. And, and I don't know if I'm cursed by biology or just I'm drinking the wrong beer, but uh, like one beer at like 6 PM. And I'm like, the next day is just depressed. And one thing which is so useful from this whole experience is that I know that the next day when someone says something to me, which is, which just hits me the wrong way. I'm like, look, I'm hungover. Like, it's not that. <laughs> it's my fucking high hangover, and it's okay. And, I, and I'm able to like sort of like pay attention to my the sensations of my body. And be like, look, the true cause of my annoyance is not this external thing. It's an internal state, uh-huh. and I and I'm just going to give it some time, and it's going to be all right. And you know, maybe I should you know, drink fewer one beer nights in my life. But nonetheless, I'm more aware of how my body is framing those emotional responses. Right, that connection be- between the sensory and the emotions. I have to open my window. My room is like 400 degrees here. One second. Oh, man. It's like 100 degrees outside. So yeah, but like you can handle oven. it. Come on now. I, I can handle it, <laughs> but I can also open a window. So yeah, you can know. also open a window. See, he's an ordinary guy through and through, people. <laughs> I love it, man. He had to pause the podcast to open a window. We're not oh, even going to edit that out. That was a beautiful move by, by Scott Carney. It please, reminds please, me yeah, of, yeah. Uh, uh, did you read The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, Dan Millman? I have not, but I've seen it. Oh, you know, as the new age guru for many years, and he had his spiritual guide, and he was showing off some of his gymnastics moves, and then his spiritual teacher, who he called Socrates, uh, went to the bathroom and took a leak, and he says, my uh, my mastery of my body just equaled what you did with your gymnastics moves, because I, I felt a sensation, and I had to go urinate. It was like a great exchange in the book. <laughs> So that's like, it flashed into my mind when you went and opened the window after writing about getting stuck in these hot boxes and <laughs> going back and forth. Uh, one thing I want you to uh, uh, enumerate is what the Limbic Librarian is all about. 
I will tell you about that, but I actually want to go back to the point you just made for a second. Opening the window? All right, let's dig in, man. I want to to go back to opening the window because, uh, well, actually, when when you talked about this guru student relationship. And there is a real problem in the world that we have right now, which is putting people on pedestals, right? We look at the person and, and the person who's closest to me right now is, is like Wim Hof, right? Because I learned his method. I studied his stuff for like 10 years, blah, blah, blah. But people have now put this man on a pedestal where they're like, oh, Wim is perfect. Like he has mastered his body in every ways. And I just want to suck the, the insight right from his uh, you know, podcast or wherever they're getting his insight, right? And they just want to like, they just want to like ab- absorb it as if Wim has like the secret to, to life. And it's not just Wim, this is like everybody, Tony Robbins, like David Goggins, me, whoever, right? The, 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 the truth is, is that a lot of these, a lot of people in this world are very special and they have like amazing insights and they can open the door for some people in, into a new way to think about their body or their life or their emotions or, or whatever. But that does not mean the totality of the person is perfect in every way. And, 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 and the, this sort of like worship that goes on on the individual as super special is frankly ridiculous and very counterproductive because it externalizes your own journey. You know, you look to somebody else and they inevitably fail you. I mean, I know Wim pretty well. And I would never want to be him. Like, that's like, he just talks nonsense half the time. He's crazy. He smells, he's, you know, has alcohol problems. Like there's all these things with him, but I still love the man because of what he has shown the world. But that does not mean I like carte blanche. Okay. Well, he's figured it out. So I'm just going to do what he does. Um, so it, like, it's important to like, like knock people off the pedestals and be like, look, thank you for giving something brilliant um, but I don't need to do everything your way because everyone's life is their own path. It's their own journey. And that's, that's the important message. Uh, and, and, you know, and they're on their journey and they're still learning things and they will always learn things. Um, so now I'm going to go back yeah, to yeah. the Mick I, I have, question. I have <laughs> also observation where, you know, we, we do this with celebrities and mm-hmm. uh, the, the athletes, the entertainers, um, the Kardashians enterprise is just so strange, you know, knowing that they rose to fame, basically doing nothing. And, um, <laughs> right. you know, the, the athletes are a good example because they, a lot of times struggle to immerse into real life and to be complete people and to be uh, decent and honorable people. And, you know, we, 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 uh, we made Lance Armstrong into a God and he did so many great things, but, you mm-hmm. know, he also did some stupid shit. And I, I, I don't want to discount like, I think he's the, one of the greatest endurance athletes of all time and winning seven oh. Tour de France's in a row is an extraordinary achievement. And now it's been diminished because of the other stupid shit he did. And, you know, we've, we've kind of misinterpreted the entire story. Same with Tiger Woods. You know, it's like mm-hmm. he's the greatest golfer of all time. What else do you want from him? He's, he's not yeah. supposed to be anything beyond that. And in fact, he was trained to be a machine to be the greatest golfer of all time right. and diminish his personal skills and his, his life skills mm-hmm. in pursuit of that goal. And that, that's, it was part and parcel in a way. Uh, so anyway, that's my rant yeah. on that on that topic. Ask, ask this man about golfing. Like, don't ask him about the stock market. I mean, unless he has special expertise in that. Like Dave Chappelle, I don't know if you've watched it. Dave Chappelle has this, these great lines right now. You know, we're in this political moment, right, where there's protests all over America for very good reasons, right? There's, you know, police violence and whatever. And, and, and Dave Chappelle says... He's watching the news and they're like, well, let's go find out what Ja Rule thinks about this. And he's like, I don't give a fuck what Ja Rule <laughs> thinks about the protests. It it's irrelevant to anything. Like, Unless he writes you know, a good song about it. I'll listen to the song. Right, right. And, and, and you know, we're, we, we, we assume that celebrity or fame or, or, or greatness, you know, Greeks would call it arete, ex- expands to everything. And it just, it doesn't. We're, we're all just fallible in certain ways, but we're also good at certain things. So pay attention to what we're good at and not what we're not good at. And this is, and it also, you know, makes this other issue is that you can get people who you admire, who then become, become leaders for the wrong qualities that, that they might need other skill sets. Um, and then they're, they're just talking nonsense. I'm not going to speak about anyone in particular, but they are out there. Um, and, uh, so, so let me go back to your earlier question. Do you want to re-ask it about the limbic librarian? 
<laughs> oh my gosh, I love where this is going. I mean, you are making the podcast rounds and talking about your book. So to, to get a little unique and creative here, I'm, I'm having a good time. I hope the listener is enjoying it too. It all started with that opening of the window, man. We opened the window to new topics and insights. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yes, this concept about the limbic librarian where we're, 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 we're creating this uh, database of experiences that's, you know, making us who we are and also how we're going to respond in the future. So I'd love to get into that a little more. So this is like the fundamental um, biology of human consciousness. Okay. So this is, this is like, when we talk about, about how you experience the world from birth, and how you understand, how you make sense of everything you ever experience. Now, we have to go back in time to some degree and think about, um, we'll actually go back in time a second. Let's think about where consciousness sits. Like most, for the most part, it's in the brain. The way we conceive of it is like, you've got this like gray matter in your skull and and that's where your thoughts happen. That's where all the, 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 your experience, your thoughts, your emotions, like if you blow your brains out, you don't have those anymore, right? So we know that it's in the brain. So how does the brain learn about the world? Because it's just sitting in your meat sack, uh, essentially floating in spinal fluid. So it's like in a float tank. It cannot sense the world directly. There's no real nerves. Like you can do you get these um, videos of people doing brain surgery. People are like poking the brain and there's nothing like they, they can feel the, the, the sensations in their body, but not the brain. So how do, does that information about the world gets translated into that float tank? And this is, this is where this concept of neural symbols shows up. So let's take um, the, the, uh, the example of, um, let's say this is the first time you've ever taken an ice bath, right? I'm an ice bath guy. We're going to talk about ice baths. And let's say somehow you're tabula rasa, which is the, you're a blank slate. You've never felt anything before because that's going to make this discussion easier. Um, and we take up a human and we dump, plunk them into an ice bath. And the first thing that happens is it senses on the skin, right? And it's like, oh crap, like your nerves fire. And they're like loud volume. There's no meaning. At this point, I and mean, this is all, this whole conversation is going to happen a mil, in a millisecond, right? It, it's it's a strong sensation, so it rockets up your nerves, goes into your spinal cord. This information, and all it has is the quality of that sensation, which has no meaning to it yet, and the volume of that sens- sensation, which is loud. Uh, and so it, it goes up to your spinal cord, and and you know because your brain is hierarchical. It's got layers and the bottom of the brain is the limbic system. This is the lizard brain. Um, it, it, it first, this information first arrives there. And you can think of the limbic system as a library because in this is contained every sensation you've ever had in your whole life. It's just, it's like just stored there. And that's because where it first arrived, I guess. And so it shows up in the limbic system. And uh, I like to think of, of, every library is having a librarian, okay? And so the librarian pulls this signal. And again, this is tabula rasa. This human has never felt anything before. So she's got an empty library. And she's like, oh, finally, my first book. And she looks at it. It's like, whoa, this is loud. And she looks at her library and there's no books there. She's like, well, I don't know what it means. So it's still no quality to it. All we know is loud. So what she does is she kicks this over to the paralympic system, which is like a centimeter away. It's a different structures. Um, And in there, there's a book binder. And what he does is, and and the paralympic system holds emotions, right? That's what happens in the paralympic system. So what what he does, I don't know why it's a he, but this guy, this book binder happens to be a he. So he takes this book binder and he, he, uh, this, this sensation of ice water. And he says, okay, ice water means your current emotional state. And, um, uh, for neuro- neurological reasons that we're not going to get into too much, you do have an instinctual reaction to ice water, which is fear and panic. It triggers your sympathetic nervous system. So it's like unmitigated fear. It's not, it's not even mediated by anything because, again, we're tabula rasa, right? Mm-hmm. It, it comes in and he's like, okay, ice water me- means unmitigated fear and panic. And he kicks it back down to the librarian. And she files away her very first book, Ice Water, The Sensation of Ice Water is unmitigated fear and panic. And then you go around and you have your, and then you experience unmitigated fear and panic. That's where the experience occurs. Now, the really interesting thing 
is at the very next time that you feel that same sensation, which actually could be only a second later because you're actually always creating neural symbols. Um, it comes in, it rockets through the, the, the system and the limbic librarian says, oh, I felt this symbol before. And she looks at her library books and she says, okay, this ice water means unmitigated terror and horror. And what this means is that Every time you feel anything, if it's not the first time, is you are living in your emotional past. And if you, if you take all of the neural symbols you've experienced, now, now we fill up the library with billions of books because it's really billions. You can think of a neural symbol just like a bit or a byte in a computer program, like a one or a zero. And when you have enough of them, right, enough ones and zeros, you can get very complex things like programs or in the human case, consciousness. And consciousness is built on this combination of sensory information and emotional information, which then goes back to what we were talking about before. Like when you're in an argument, it's a sensation and an emotion going on. And, um, and what, we, what I've learned, and you know, I'm probably not the first person to think of it. Actually, I know I'm not the first person to think of this. Um, it's that while you cannot get rid of a neural symbol, those are just there forever. I mean, maybe Alzheimer's or something could get rid of it. Neural degeneration could get rid of it. But basically, they're stuck there, these neural symbols. While you can't get rid of them, what you can do is put new neural symbols on that shelf. So that next, let's say you wanted to say ice water is not that bad, right? What if you wanted to teach yourself that ice water is not bad? Then what you do is you create a new emotion, usually in advance, right? You, mm. you try to like create joy. And you say, this ice water is joy. You tell that ice water, that ice water is joy. You tell your brain that this is joy. And that sort of short circuits this process. And the, the librarian has to actually make it, uh, the book binder has to make a new symbol. And then you start expanding that shelf that she's got on ice water. So instead of just unmitigated horror and panic, she also has the joy one to choose from. And if you, and if you load up more and more and more books on that shelf, you create choice for your brain and then you create resilience. Whew, that's deep, man. I know, right to the brainstem. Again, because it can apply to, to everything. And I love how you took it to the, the massive challenge of uh, dieting, losing weight. You did it this crazy Scott Carney way with your potato diet. So I'd love to <laughs> keep that conversation thread going into this, uh, this experiment that you did and what you learned from that. So with the potatoes... <laughs> um, regarding you know, the potatoes, regarding the potatoes. So I don't really write about diet, right? There's so many people out there who care about nutrition and like how you could do things to lose weight or get jacked or all of these things. And I'm actually fairly skeptical of almost every program out there. Like my general feeling is that if someone has a very restrictive diet, you know, keto, whole 30, whatever it is, right. It doesn't really matter. Um, oftentimes people will use this to disguise an eating disorder, right? I'm going to control everything, right? How many people do you know who are so into wellness that they look frail and fragile and they're going to die? Like there's a lot of people out there. So, well, I know that there are people who are great nutritionists and there is probably a way to perfect your body and health and whatever. I'm not into it. That's not what I write about. What I do write about are the sensations and emotions of food. And when you go to a grocery store and you walk down the aisles, uh, and you look at a bag of, say, Cheetos, uh, I'm pretty sure that it says something on the bag to the equivalent of, it is a party in your mouth, right? <laughs> like, like, what does it mean? Like, why is there a party in your mouth going on in this, in this thing? Well, the, the food industry is very, very aware of the connection between emotion and, and taste, which is a sensation, right? And they're trying to create a... Um, you know, they're trying to force a neural symbol on you and they have done it incredibly successfully because our taste system, believe it or not, um, was not to, built to detect parties in your mouth. It was built to detect nutrients in the environment that you needed. And so, so when you walked around your paleolithic past, and you saw a berry bush and you put the berry in your mouth and it was sweet. You're like, oh my God, these are carbohydrates that can make me survive. Right. And, and the quality of those tastes had real visceral meaning that you probably learned over time, right? You, people told you about stuff and like there was ways that information got there, but that taste was an important way to understand the universe. Fast forward to now, our taste system is just a way to connect parties to mouths. Like, like, you know, <laughs> I, 
you it's go to the grocery hijacked, store. Man, it's been hijacked. Totally. Like, you know, I go to like the yogurt stores, like, oh, Greek yogurt. Am I going on a trip to Greece? Like, what the fuck is that about? Like, no, I mean, it's, it's they're really pairing all of these the, like external weird things to your, your brain in order to make you a better consumer. And that's not really what our taste system was um, emerged for, evolved for. So what I did was there's this thing called the potato hack, which is like sort of a fad crash diet um, where and I don't recommend this for like someone's lifestyle. This is something I think you should do for like two or three days to see what happens. And yes, you can lose a lot of weight on it, but that's not why I was interested in it. Because what you do is potatoes are the blandest food in the world. And, and the potato hack is you just eat potatoes for as long as you have breakfast, lunch, dinner. And we're not talking French fries. There's no oil. You can put at most a pinch of salt and you're boiling these things. Like we should want flavorless, bland, just potatoes. And the reason you do this is because potatoes, in, in addition to having some, some, like something called resistant starch, which supposedly resets your gut bacteria, which is not really what I care about, but it's there. Um, what it is is basically a fast without hunger because potatoes have the quality of being the, the most satiating food on the planet. Um, if you eat, I think it's something like 700 calories of potatoes, it's like you're eating 2,300 calories of potatoes. So it's like you can eat just 700 calories, but you're fully satiated for the day. And so it's like makes this really interesting way to do a fast without hunger. And that's why I did potatoes. So I ate them for three days and I'm trying to decouple uh, as much as you can in three days. And this is not like a whole revolution, but what it does is it changes your relationship with taste, even in a short period where you're like, um, you know, I noticed myself, for instance, just eating potatoes that I would just like phantom walk to the refrigerator to grab a yogurt or something. And like, why was I do? Why am I doing this? And like, I eventually caught myself as I'm like opening the lid. I'm like, oh, crap. Like, like my body has been hijacked by some sort of emotional need um, for that yogurt, whatever nutrient that's giving. I mean, think about the apocryphal story of like a pregnant woman. And now, uh, like when, when you're you're a woman and I don't know how, um, I mean, I guess I remember my mother being pregnant, right? And and there's always a story though of like uh, of like a woman being like, "Husband, you must go out get me pickles and peanut butter right now, right?" There's like these weird cravings. Well, what are those cravings really? Maybe it's like your ancient taste system coming in and being like, "I need a certain type of nutrient mm -hmm. in that pickle." It's not the taste of the pickle; it's like the nutrient. And somehow saying, "Go get that thing to sort of feed my body in a very deep way," and and in a way, the potato diet lets you access that. Um, you're eating just potatoes. So, so, so you've turned down that constant availability of flavor and emotion that you have so that, that you can start to like pay attention to your body again. And it's really this awesome experience to do. Although I will say that some people hate it. Like my wife, who I, you know, she, my wife is the real hero of the book, Laura. Um, she got she, dragged into so many things, man. I couldn't believe it. And then you're like talking about your Latvian spa retreat and Laura this and Laura that. I'm like, I can't believe she got dragged on that trip too. What a what a superstar. I know, totally. She is definitely a superstar. Kettlebell oh, throwing. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah, she's awesome. Uh, and I got very lucky to be with her. Um, oh, she has a podcast called Wild Thing about her, her year long search for Bigfoot. Go listen to it. Um, nice. So, all right. Um, but yeah, I mean, she, so she's his partner. And, and, and what's very useful to think about. Um, so, my experience to the potato diet is like, I could do this for like months if I needed to, because I can. I somehow am built to like be able to deal with routine pretty well. If for some reason my, I could just do that. She is someone who like needs change and novelty. And so for three days for me, it was like, eh, all right. For her, it was like torture. She hates at the end of the, the, uh, the third day of the potato diet. She's like, I just don't want to eat anymore. I'm just not going to eat. Potato. I give up. <laughs> and, uh, and what, what's fascinating about the wedge and this whole process that I've been through is that, Everything is subjective. Like the only objective fact about human experience and consciousness is that everything is individualized. Everything is objective, and how you you um, you you take information about the outside world. Oh my God, I'm ringing. Um, uh, and how you take information from the outside world and then process it uh, is is entirely individual. Which means that. Even though I have 10 techniques that I do in the wedge, it does not mean that 
it's like the recipe of 10 super awesome things that you should do to make you super awesome. There are things that are going to work for you and things that are not going to work for you. And you need to process it yourself. Uh, and it's important to try a bunch of stuff. And I give you some examples of things you can try, but if it doesn't speak to you, if it doesn't actually um, nurture you in the way you want it to, then once you've tried it, then just do something else. There's a million things you can try. But Scott, there's no gimmick there. How how's that gonna you know? I know. You, you don't have a product I mean, behind it to sell everyone, like the the kettlebell with two handles on it or something. I need a fucking supplement company or something. I don't know, man. Like I definitely made a big error in my um uh, uh, uh worldview is that I can't sell you a pill to fix yourself. My message is basically, yeah, you're gonna have to try stuff and do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Well, we'll be waiting for your next book to, to keep us going. But uh, so the, you described eating the potatoes uh, satisfied your hunger tremendously, I guess. I thought protein was that most satiating food, but you're, you're citing the research that, it, that chowing a potato makes you feel really full. So by doing so, you kind of got hunger off the table so right. that you could you could truly desensitize to all the uh, the marketing messages that's been pounded into your head. I guess you know our experience with food uh, we've accumulated throughout our life. So when Grandma served us the apple pie and and the smell, mm -hmm. and we're we're going back to Grandma's kitchen and all these other sensations that are kind of unrelated to the lack of nutrition in the apple pie. Is that kind of uh, what we're talking about with the? Oh, totally. And it and you know what. I'm going to go on the record and say if, if grandma's apple pie gives you good feelings, there's nothing wrong with that, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it, it, we, I mean, you've heard of emotional eaters before, right? And, and people like, this is one potential uh, cause for obesity that I've heard about, um, right? Which is that you just eat emotionally to sort of fill a void in yourself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it can certainly be um, not great, for your health, but also it can be great. Like, like, you know, there's a, I, I'm an anthropologist by training, right? And there's this whole, can you, you stop bringing me, whoever you are. Um, the, you like my ghost ring. Woo! I thought it was a tea <laughs> kettle boiling up or something. Um, uh, but the, uh, I've totally lost your anthropologist, your anthropologist oh, right. by training. Right. So the anthropology by training, and there's this whole field of anthropology called commensality, which means um, people who get together and eat and how eating, the act, social act of eating creates um, uh, uh, social networks and creates these bonds that are very important for society. So your grandma's apple pie, which you eat and it gives you fond memories of your grandma, actually does great things for community. Um, it's just that Cheetos party in your mouth making you a better consumer is maybe really good for the, the Cheetos brand, but maybe not good for you. Although I love Cheetos on road trips, so, you know. <laughs> so Cheetos is associated with cool, awesome road trips, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but and not feeling gosh. horrible about yourself after you ate a whole bag. <laughs> right. But I mean, to, to, to pause for a moment and not, not judge anything, um, I, I'm kind of pulling that message out here too, where you say, you said the three main building blocks of human existence is time, emotion, and sensation. We've mm -hmm. talked a lot about that. Uh, and so if that's the case, then if you deem uh, Cheetos and your road trip to be super awesome, my gosh, I mean, it's, or, you know, sitting in front of the TV and binging on Netflix and never going near a cold plunge. Uh, I guess that's okay too. But I think, um, you know, the, the, the summation of your journey is that maybe it's, maybe we have a, a, a hidden sense of restlessness on we because things are too easy and we don't pursue these activities and these sensations that, you know, make us human and really light us up and, make us appreciate that connection with nature when you're one with the mountain. I mean, right. speaking of Cheetos, you said it's a cheesy statement, but when you were there and you were one with that mountain, that's, you know, that that's hugely uh, significant mm -hmm. to your, to your emotions and your sensations. Right. Well, I mean, here's the thing is that uh, I generally tell people if they want to live their life with Cheetos and doing Netflix, there's nothing like fundamentally wrong with that. I mean, if that's your life choice, and you're cool with it, then I'm cool with it too. Um, however, since yeah, but look, look, Scott in the eye when you say that, because that's yeah. when you can really peer into the person's soul. 
Okay. Uh, but when, but, but since we think about ourselves as overcoming challenges, right? This, I said this earlier, is that we think of ourselves, we, we try to tell the story of ourselves doing, you know, attempting greatness. And, and if you never expand out of a narrow band of comfort, you never actually approach I mean, for the person who, who just does Cheetos, then they're like, well, even just going outside on a walk around the block is their attempt at greatness. But honestly, we are, as humans, capable of so much more than that. So I do think that we do need variation and we need things to innervate. You know, we have these two types of nervous, nervous system responses. There's called parasympathetic and, and sympathetic, which is basically um, sympathetic means fight or flight response. And parasympathetic is, uh, is rest and digest. Well, most of us stay in rest and digest all the time. Like, <laughs> like you know, you, you don't really feel that fight or flight. You don't really, um, you don't really feel the real fight or flight, right? You know, you, you sometimes that system will get active in the in the in the rest and digest um, environment, which then makes your rest and digest environment seem stressful. Um, but if you actually go out and you're, you know, you're fighting a tiger, for instance, that's where we all come from. We fight tigers. And that's where you, if you fight the tiger, or if you run from that tiger, there's no other, you can't rest and digest your way through that situation. Um, it, it, where we evolve from, there are always some dangers out there, right? The, 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 the constant was a, um, a, a parody between um, times when you're in fight or flight and times when you're rest and digest. Mm-hmm. But in the modern world, where we're basically always in rest and digest, that active system uh, doesn't have an outlet. And it turn and the energy that it provides, adrenaline and cortisol. And it's not like you didn't don't have those hormones anymore, right? They're still going around you, and they need a physical outlet sometimes. And this is why I think that somebody who sits on their couch and just does just does Cheetos and Netflix, um, they're actually going to start feeling really crummy. They're going to start feeling really confined and they're going to, anytime they push themselves, it's going to trigger anxiety. They're probably going to get um, Mm. autoimmune illnesses and other things like that because they're not giving themselves the dynamism, which was the constant in our evolutionary past. And so things like ice baths, things like throwing kettlebells, things like heat training, things like, I don't know, whatever you do that, that pushes yourself, all of that stuff um, helps uh, balance out the, the, the parity between rest and digest and fight or flight. That was a pretty powerful concluding statement, man. I love it. Let's get out there and let's get out there and honor our humanity and try stuff. And also, you know, getting into that flow state requires an appropriately difficult challenge. So the Cheeto person who's walking around the block, they're not going to experience that because it's, it's, it's nothing, uh, nothing to write home about. And, you know, and you find that instead of, like having increasingly narrow areas where you're comfortable by stressing, by putting yourself in stressful situations and then relaxing in those strict situations, you expand the boundaries of where you are comfortable. And that's the goal. Now your boundaries have expanded instead of comfort being this sort of like platonic ideal. If only I can find the right bed and the right pillows and the right things to (laughs) to put me in the perfect state of comfort. Like even those pillows are going to get uncomfortable, right? Right. Um, Instead of what you do is you become more robust so that everywhere you go or more places you go are, are comfortable. And that's really the, the, the secret is that by putting yourself out there, um, you know, the world opens up um, to you. Love it, man. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm wondering uh, what's next for you. What's the life of a writer like you now you're promoting the heck out of this book. And um, where do you go from here? So I'm working on, uh, I have, uh, I'm just finishing up the manuscript for another book. Um, I should be finished this in July at some point. Uh, and I have this other book idea that I'm working on, but it has nothing to do with this biohacking stuff now. Now I'm interested in the really, you know, one of the things that I talk about, we didn't talk about here is how we're all humans are connected, right? There's sort of a consciousness, which is, um, uh, that c- arises out of hu- in, in the interplay of human activity. So you think of the thing, the word is called super organism is that there's a logic to human activity, which is bigger than um, the individual conscious of you and me, but actually all human activity together. So I'm looking at um, a storm that hit Bangladesh, what is now Bangladesh in 1970 and killed half a million people. It was the deadliest storm in human history. And that storm changed the outcome of an election uh, which, cha- which which made one government that was tyrannical start a genocide, which started a war, which started an invasion, which started which almost brought the U.S. and the, and the USSR into um, Cold War 
standoff. Like there, we were, we were go, heading down the DEF cons, right? And, and uh, this event I'm talking about as like sort of uh, the weather and like, and climate change even, how that um, uh, is a force in and of its own self. How like these storms land on shores and they, they not only cause damage, but they change the political landscape, the emotional landscape and, and, and how we should be thinking about that. So that, that book is just about done. And I'm, I'm following all these stories of these awesome, like I, I met this guy in Bangladesh well, it was Pakistan at that time, um, who was in the army. He was actually a soccer star. He was like the Pele of Pakistan. And then he uh, joined the army, uh, uh, the Pakistani army. And then the, the storm happened and he, his family all got killed. And then, uh, and then the, the Pakistani started murdering everybody. And then he actually leads a mutiny. And it was so cool to talk with this person. It was like, yeah, I was on one, in one minute, I was on this side. And I'm standing with all the officers. And the next minute, I'm on this side. And we're all in the same room. <laughs> and, wow! Oh, it's been it's been a it's been a blast to write this uh, this book. So that's right coming on. out in 2021. Okay, Scott Carney, go find the wedge. It's a beautiful piece of work. And what doesn't kill us? The book before that. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, thank you for having me. I I, I love coming on your show. Thank you for listening to the show. We would love your feedback at getoveryourselfpodcast at gmail.com. And we would also love if you could leave a rating and a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. I know it's a hassle. You have to go to desktop iTunes, click on the tab that says ratings and reviews, and then click to rate the show anywhere from five to five stars. And it really helps spread the word so more people can find the show and get over themselves, because they need to. Thanks for doing it.